This video is part of a study series titled Biblical Salvation Settled Once and for All. Please see the playlist link in the video description. Hello and welcome back. So in this part of the series we'll be looking at John chapter 8 and in this study what we're going to be uh, picking out of this chapter is, is what do these things mean? So when Jesus says to the crowd, he that is with, without sin among you, uh, when he said to the woman caught in adultery, go and sin no more. And when he said to the Jews and Pharisees, I am the light of the world, you shall die in your sins if you continue in my word. Uh, a particular tricky one here, whosoever commits sin is the servant of sin, the son shall make you free. What exactly does Jesus mean by that? And the dichotomy here between Abraham's seed and the sons of the devil. So these are all the themes that we're going to be picking out of John chapter 8 to help build our salvation doctrine in this series. So to kick off this story, then we have the, the well-known story of the woman caught in adultery. So starting at verse 1 or until verse 7, Jesus went onto the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery, and when they had set her in, her in the midst, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what do you say? This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him, but Jesus stooped down, and with his finger wrote on the ground, as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself, and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. So as we see this story introduced, notice that the context of the story is a potential physical condemnation. The woman was caught in a, in a situation where she could have literally been stoned to death. Now the Pharisees were, were trying to put Jesus in a trap here, because under the Mosaic law, she should have been put to death if there were multiple witnesses to the offence. But uh, remember that Israel was subject to Roman law, so secular law wouldn't enable them to carry this out. So they could accuse Jesus of either denying God's law or stirring strife under the Roman law. So they are attempting to, to trap him in this situation. But the fact that it's a physical condemnation where she could have, in quite a literal sense of the word, be stoned to death, uh, that's very important for setting the premise of this story. And just in case you're wondering, notice that the Pharisees were already familiar uh, with who Jesus was before this event. So this this was a deliberate setup. Now, it's not hugely important to this immediate story. It will become more important later when Jesus speaks to the Pharisees again. Now, here in verse 7, it may be misunderstood what exactly Jesus meant uh, by this, that, that he that with, he's without sin among you, let him cast the stone. Um, Christians with a, a poor understanding of the Bible, they, they use that verse to, in, in a sense, reject correction, um, arguing that, well, no Christian should be judging or criticising another Christian for their sins or, or whatever the reason, because after all, he that is without sin uh, cast a stone. And so this verse here becomes an excuse uh, for sin, sin, essentially, because it's like saying, well, Jesus himself let her off the hook. Um but first of all, uh, well, the thing is, I might say to somebody, um, it's wrong to do this, or churches are wrong for enabling that, or these people are allowing and endorsing sin. And sometimes I'm not even necessarily judging or condemning people in an eternal life sense. It's just something on this earth that they are doing wrong, that they should be doing right. And then I've been talked down to somebody and they just say, well, he that is without sin, you know, cast the first stone. You shouldn't be judging people because you have sin as well. But the problem is, if you just examine what's going on in this story, this woman is not merely being criticised or judged for adultery. They were appealing to Jesus to literally stone her to death. This is a very literal casting of stones. It's not metaphorical about judging someone or telling them that they're wrong. So this this passage has nothing to do with, uh, like, judge not lest thou be judged, or, you know, a, a physical condemnation is about to take place here. That's the context of Jesus saying this statement. OK, continuing this story then to verses 8 through 11, we see that the scribes and Pharisees failed to trap Jesus and consequently they left. Uh, they didn't they didn't condemn the woman. So following this, Jesus did not condemn her either. So let, let's just read what happened at the end of this story. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground and they which heard it being convicted by their own conscience went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last and Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. 
When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those your accusers? Has no man condemned you? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Now, people with um, a works-based kind of a salvation, they, they interpret this passage to mean that Jesus is giving the woman here um, another chance to repent, you might say, once and for all. And if she accepts this chance, she won't be condemned. But if she continues in sin, then she will be condemned by which which they mean hell. When Jesus said, uh, you know, neither do I condemn you. And then when he says, go and sin no more. Well, this this then leads to false doctrines such as uh, sinless perfectionism and conditional security, where we can lose our salvation. So I'm, I'm going to tackle that in light of this passage. So to the first thing to debunk those uh, false interpretations here is that as far as we can tell from this passage, from the words that the narrator has offered us, there is no prospect of eternal condemnation or eternal life in this passage. The context of the condemnation is a physical condemnation only. They were literally proposing to stone her, but nobody condemned her, so Jesus did not condemn her to be stoned to death either. Beyond this, we we have no context at all that's related to hell or damnation. Uh, moreover, again, in the story, Jesus, as far as we know, never mentioned believing on him or eternal life. He just didn't mention those two things. So th this is not the context of Jesus' conversation with her either then. The prospect of her salvation, whether she could go to hell or won't go to hell, or will, that, that's just not documented in this story at all. If you want to make it about eternal condemnation, you're, you're adding conjecture to the text because there's not enough there to make anything about eternal life. This is a physical condemnation only. Now, you might say unto me, then, well, why does it matter that Jesus didn't mention eternal life? Well, the thing is, uh, if you've watched my previous video in this series about John chapter 5, um, I delved into this statement, sin no more, uh, because here in John 8, this is the second time that Jesus said sin no more. Uh, so people with a, a works-based salvation, they love to quote verses like this as a salvation instruction, even though that's not even how Jesus used it. Because the thing is, he isn't talking about eternal life here in John chapter 8 and he didn't talk about it in John 5. Now I've sort of cut the sentence short there. What I mean is when he didn't talk about it in John 5 I mean in relation to the saying sin no more. That's that's where he never mentioned it. He did mention it later in John chapter 5 but not in the context of saying sin no more. So here are example comments of people on social media who take this statement from John 8, you know, sin no more and they apply it to the gospel. So you might see a YouTube video where someone's debating or discussing, well, if I still have sin in my life, am I still saved? And then people just put these off the cuff comments like, well, go and sin no more. Sounds pretty clear to me. Easy believism is right up there with the deadly doctrine of one saved, always saved. And Go and sin no more. Makes sense. Jesus said, go and sin no more. Sounds like they love their sin more than God and so on and so on and so on. So they're using these verses as if this is part of the gospel, go and sin no more. But Jesus isn't mentioning eternal life in the two places where he says that statement. Now, a, a sinless perfectionist, so someone who says we have to be absolutely sinless in order to go into heaven, they might ask a hypothetical question. Well, why would Jesus tell someone to go and sin no more if it were not possible to never sin again? Like, Because you might argue it's redundant advice. Well, this is begging the question, though, because it already presupposes that this is the way that Jesus used that statement. So when Jesus said, go and sin no more, they assume that Jesus meant absolutely never, ever sin again in your entire life if you want to make it to heaven. But as we already saw from the studio video of John 5, if you want to go back and, and find that out, because I think I spent about 30 minutes on, on this issue of sin no more. We don't know what the underlying sins the man at Bethesda had done and whether or not such sins directly resulted in him being lame in the first place. In John chapter 8, only the woman's adultery is addressed. No other sins she has, or may have, are addressed. For all we know, she could have also been a drunkard, but that didn't result in her being stoned to death, though. So we, we just don't have that context there that, that sin no more really means that in the way that a sinless perfectionist would interpret it. And moreover, if we have three key similarities between sin no more in John chapter 5 and go and sin no more in John chapter 8. 
Only physical tribulation or condemnation can be proven as the context in both cases. For the lame man that was healed, he was told to sin no more so that no worse thing would come upon him. Now, some people assume that means hell, but Jesus could have just cut the fluffy language and said hell if that's what he really meant. And obviously we don't want to accuse Jesus of using fluffy language to, you know, hide what he really means. And again, as we've just seen from the John 8 scenario, only a physical condemnation is proven as the context of this statement. Moreover, based on the information that we have from these passages, we don't know what kind of life either person lived after this encounter with Jesus. We don't know if the John 5 man or the John 8 woman lived a literally sinless life after their encounter with Jesus. In other words, we don't have enough salient facts to make such a huge doctrine out of these three words. So you can't just say, well, Jesus said sin no more, so we must never sin again, because you're going well beyond the available facts where it actually sets up what Jesus means by this statement. There's actually, as well, technically speaking, no, no absolute proof that either of them were eternally saved before, during, or after their encounter with Jesus. We assume that they may have got saved then and there, but the thing is, we don't really know. They could have been saved before then. They could have maybe not believed on Christ straight away at that encounter and maybe believed on him sometime later. Maybe he healed them or he, um, you know, he saved them in that sense, but he didn't actually, they didn't actually get eternally saved. The thing is, we don't know. These are not sufficient salvation passages because we don't know about the man at the pool of Bethesda. We don't know enough about the woman caught in adultery. We do not have background about their before, during and after, other than what it does give us for the during. We only have that little bit. And then finally, just a, a few more points that I want to point out from my, st I did a study on John chapter five and I, I mentioned these points. If sinning no more is such an essential component of the gospel, in other words, you have to literally sin no more to be saved, then you have to explain why Jesus frequently doesn't mention it in all of the John passages where he does actually talk about eternal life clearly, and he keeps mentioning to believe on him. Um, you can easily cherry pick verses like these about sinning no more, but you then have to ignore all the verses that talk about forgiveness, God's ongoing, uh, God's ongoing mercy for believers. You have to assume that that doesn't exist, basically. Or like in how the Lord's Prayer says, give us, Lord, our daily bread and forgive us our sins. He's teaching us how to pray. Well, why would he teach us how to pray and say forgive our sins if we don't still have sin? That would, that really, that dismantles itself. So you have to cherry pick these verses. And, and likewise, you know, the reverse is true. We shouldn't just cherry pick all the verses about forgiveness and mercy and pretend that Jesus never said sin no more. That's what a lot of the charismatics and Pentecostals and liberal Christians tend to do. You know, you know, two sides cherry picking the verses. Well, I only, we need to bring both of them together. Yes, sin no more, but yes, forgive us our sins to both of those things. And there are plenty of verses that deal with the issue of a believer that sins, which again would be completely redundant and useless according to the sinless perfectionist view. I, I've dealt with some verses like that in other videos in this series. So to wrap this up then, um, if you want more study on the issue of sin no more, uh, go back and see my John 5 study video where I, I delved into it in a bit more detail than in this study. So I'm not going to uh, recover the same ground. So in verse 12, then, when it says, then spoke Jesus unto them, saying, well, we already saw earlier in the verses that the scribes and Pharisees already knew to some extent who Jesus was. And now Jesus is speaking on to them again. So this sets the context for Jesus's next conversation, because he will still be talking about eternal life, but he will not be appealing to this group so strongly to believe on him as he's done with other people that he spoke to earlier chapters in John. And he will give some hard sayings in this chapter. So yes, he will tell them to believe on him, but he won't be doing it as with as much of an appeal as he has done with, with previous chapters. So then, between verses 12 to 18, then spoke Jesus unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. The Pharisees therefore said unto him, You bear record of yourself, your record is not true. Jesus answered and said unto them, Though I bear record of myself, yet my record is true, for I know from where I came and where I go, but you cannot tell from where I came and where I go. You judge after the flesh, I judge no man, and yet if I judge, my judgment is true. For I am not alone, but I and the Father that sent me. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am one that bear witness of myself, and the Father that sent me bears witness of me. <laughs> 
Now, sometimes the, the people that believe in work salvation and, and conditional security, they make these really big doctrines about what exactly it means to follow Jesus for eternal life. Um, when it, you know, where it says, he that follows me shall not work, work, um, walk in darkness. And they say things like, well, you've got to pick up your cross and follow me and, and this, that and the other. But throughout the conversation in this chapter, although Jesus touches on the subject of eternal life, it is not as big of a subject matter as his relationship with the Father, which seems to be a much bigger subject matter in this particular chapter. And that's going to be the um, immediate upcoming context um, from verse 12. And so it's more. this chapter is really more about the hard-heartedness of the people who reject him rather than specifically how to be saved as as a kind of instruction um, and as a side note you know up until now jesus has very very consistently told people to believe on him for eternal life and so if you're going to say well that, uh, how do we follow him to walk in the light in, in the context of getting saved anyway it's to believe on him obviously when we're saved then we can talk about those other verses about obeying his commandments and such but in the context of eternal life it's believing on him because that's what he told us to do for that particular purpose now, just to append one more verse uh, onto our scope here. So in verse 19, they said unto him, where is your father? Jesus answered, you neither know me nor my father. If you had known me, you should have known my father also. And what will come about strongly in this chapter is that in the New Testament, you, you cannot be considered saved while consequently rejecting the Messiah also. And, and this is important because some Christians have a rather unwarranted fascination with the religion of Judaism and, and the nation of Israel. I, I call it a Jewish fetish that, that some Christians have, a, a somewhat unhealthy obsession with this. Um, they consider Jewish people and the nation of Israel to be their brethren concerning the faith. Um, but the split between Christianity and Judaism, the very reason that exists is very precisely because the Jews rejected Jesus as the Messiah, as many Jews in this chapter will do. Jesus is very clear here that one cannot know the Father without knowing the Son, because the Father bears witness of him. So to reject Jesus as the Christ is to reject the witness of the Father. The Jews cannot be yoked with Christians as both being God's people if they reject the Father's witness, because they essentially make him a liar. I mean, a, a good qualifying verse for this, 1 John 5.10, He that believes on the Son of God has the witness in himself. He that believes not God has made him a liar because he believes not the record that God gave his Son. So this is very, very fundamental to believing the Father is believing on the Son. Now, just in case you might wonder, perhaps maybe possibly the Pharisees had no credible reason to believe that Jesus was the Christ. Um, after all, if he bears witness of himself, well, obviously anybody can claim to be the Messiah. So how should they know that Jesus is legitimate over anybody else claiming to be such? Well, remember that the context leading up to this, as per verse 12, the Pharisees already had some idea of, of who he is. They'd obviously dealt with him before. And John's gospel doesn't detail as many of Jesus's miracles as the other gospels do and some of Jesus's exchanges with the Pharisees and the chief priests and the Jews and scribes that are described in John tend to focus more on Jesus's doctrines and eternal life rather than his miracles whereas in some of the other gospels it's perhaps more about his miracles so here are some key summary points leading up to this conversation so we already saw in previous chapters of John that there was conflict about Jesus claim to being the Christ in John chapter 7, there were disputes as to whether he was the Christ or whether he wasn't, according to his teachings. In John chapter 6, Jesus did the miracle of the five loaves and the two fish, and some of the Jews receiving it approached him later to hear more, but ended up rejecting him anyway, um, as did some of his own disciples, actually. In John chapter 5, Jews sought to kill Jesus for doing a miracle on the Sabbath day, so they knew he could do miracles. So you get the sense that a lot of them already had some idea that he'd done these things. So they really were without excuse. And later in John's Gospel, uh, in chapter 10, uh, between 37 and 38, that they should, who should believe that Jesus is the Father because of the works he does. He demonstrated his sonship by his works and his teachings and miracles. So he did the works and told them to the, believe on his works, if they don't at least believe in him, to prove that he really is who he says he is. 
We see in other Gospels that Jesus did miracles before important Jews. So, for example, the scribes in Mark chapter 3, and they accused him of doing it such by the power of the devil. So it's likely that the people in this chapter have no particular excuse. They, they must have some idea about who he is. So reading three more verses in them between 20 to 22, These words spoke Jesus in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no man laid hands on him, for his hour was not yet come. Then said Jesus again unto them, I go my way, and you shall seek me, and shall die in your sins. Where I go, you cannot come. Then said the Jews, Will he kill himself, because he says, Where I go, you cannot come. Now, the earlier context in verse 13 suggested that Jesus was only talking to the Pharisees, but as Jesus is preaching in the treasury, as we see from verse 20, the context in verse 22 is now changed to the Jews. So there's probably a wider Jewish audience than just the Pharisees in the upcoming dialogue. Um, it is likely that he was mainly talking primarily to, to, to the Pharisees, at least at first, but then other Jews were also listening in on the conversation, because according to verse 22, the Jews were talking amongst themselves rather than directly talking to, to Jesus. And uh, despite the negative theme of the upcoming conversation, Jesus has some of the Jews will believe on him, which we'll see in later verses. Now, verse 21, where it says, I go my way and you shall seek me and shall die in your sins. Where I go, you cannot come. This seems to give the impression that the Pharisees are now at a point where even if they were to seek Jesus, they will not find the path to eternal life to be saved. And so they will die in their sins. Now, when it says you shall seek me, um, I would say that this is in the context of seeking him for the purpose of seeing the light as as per the previous verses that we looked at not necessarily to catch him and kill him although that, that is the underlying context of the dialogue so that is to clarify exactly what he means by you shall seek me uh, jesus is giving much less emphasis to believing on him for the purpose of eternal life in this chapter because the jews especially the pharisees have rejected him as christ multiple times up to now and uh, have tried to catch him before uh, we briefly touched on this in, in John 7, but didn't delve into it uh, too deeply. So um, we could address this issue of spiritual hard-heartedness now. Um, however, there's a more clear passage in John chapter 12. So for now, I'm going to wait for that until later in the series when I can deal with John chapter 12. And then I'll deal with the issue of somebody hardening their heart to the point where they're not even going to be able to find the light anymore. They're not even going to be able to seek Jesus. So I'm going to park that idea um, for now. Now, just to pick up on this other thing he said in verse 21, what exactly does it mean, I go my way and where I go you cannot come? Well, the context clarifies it in verses 23 and 24. So it says, and he said unto them, you are from beneath, I am from above, you are of this world, I am not of this world. I said therefore unto you that you shall die in your sins, for if you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. So Jesus is from above, which common sense would tell you means heaven. We know that Jesus will ascend to heaven later, although that's still some time away from this particular conversation. And the Pharisees cannot come with him to heaven, presumably, but rather they shall die in their sins because they do not believe that Jesus is he. So I think the context there would tell you that that's what that means. Moving on to verses 25 to 30 then. Then said they unto him, Who are you? And Jesus said unto them, Even the same that I said unto you from the beginning. I have many things to say and to judge of you, but he that sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. They understood not that he spoke to them of the Father. Then Jesus said unto them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall you know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father has taught me, I speak these things. And he that sent me is with me, the Father has not left me alone, for I do always the things that please him. As he spoke these words, many believed on him. So many of the Jews listening to Jesus at this time may know that Jesus is he after he has been crucified. They, they lift him up. Uh, many Jews believed on him after this dialogue as per verse 30. Now it may not be immediately obvious at the time of Jesus' crucifixion that Jesus would know—sorry—that uh, the Jews would know that Jesus is He, uh, that being the Christ or the Son of God. 
In fact, it seems that by watching him die, many watching actually despised him for not lifting himself off the cross. But remember that in Acts chapter 2 and 3, that the apostles will preach to, to many Jews and, and some will be converted. On to verses 31 and 32. Then said Jesus to the Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. So uh, this verse in 31, this is used to promote conditional security because Jesus requires that the audience continue in his word so as to be his disciples, which is taken to mean be saved in, in this particular context. So the prospect of not continuing would cease this discipleship and thereby salvation, which is how they interpret it. Now, um, advocates of faith alone and eternal security usually make a clear distinction between discipleship or, or fellowship and eternal life itself. So if an opponent would point out a verse like this about warnings against uh a believer not continuing or, or sins or whatever it might be that someone will then reply well that verse is in response to um discipleship it's not about salvation okay but in this context though and in the flavor of the overall passage and, and what's been leading up to this verse jesus said this specifically to the jews that believed on him and so it seems that at least in this context be uh, being a disciple here is synonymous or intertwined with salvation itself rather than something that's distinct from salvation and so continuing in his word would seem to be an important command required for eternal life now it's too early in the series to address continuation in the context of salvation yet because it would be better for me to address that later in the series when we look at john chapter 15 where christ instructs his disciples to abide in him so i'm not going to address it in great detail now but the simple short answer is that if continuing in christ's word is necessary for salvation this this is in relation to your belief it's not your works of obedience because this was proven back in john chapter 5 in verse 38 and uh, where christ said to some people you have not his word abiding in you for whom he has sent him you believe not so that word abiding is similar to continuing and again it's this concept of his word um conditional security falls apart because they often associate these continuation with works rather than um faith um, and we already really have already dealt with conditional security uh, in this series so far and in, in relation to it we we studied john chapter 6 earlier in this series and we saw how jesus defines his disciples who walked no more with him which you might argue is synonymous with with not continuing in his word because it was jesus words about eating his flesh and, and they stumbled on those words so the disciples that walk no more with him you could say they are they are those who did not continue in his word well we saw from john chapter 6 that those disciples jesus put them in the category of believe not jesus knew from the beginning that they believe not so it's meaningless to say that they were temporarily saved until they stopped continuing in his word and then lost their salvation because jesus already foresaw that this would happen they do not really believe so it's pointless to say that they were saved or believed for a while it, it just doesn't make sense to say that in the totality of jesus words and so piecing together what we've learned so far in our study of John in the series, we can see what happens to those who continue in his word versus those who didn't. So John 8.31 does not contradict eternal security in any way whatsoever. So this is just a nice little graph to prove that. So this guy here believes, gets saved. All that which the Father has given me, I should lose nothing. We, agree, we believe that Jesus is going to fulfill what he said he would do. Well, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed? once saved always saved now the guy that does not continue in his word well jesus knew from the beginning who believed not and who would betray him whosoever doesn't believe in him is condemned because he has not believed in him that's what john has said in previous chapters so it's not he didn't lose his salvation it's not once saved always saved because he didn't continue it's twice lost always lost he was always lost that's why he didn't continue makes perfect sense when you just compare it with everything that that john's gospel has set up to now now, in verse 32, where Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free, there needs to be careful thought about what Jesus means by this statement. What, what exactly does the truth set us free from, you might ask? 
Uh, a sinless perfectionist would say, well, it's sin. You need to be set free from sin so that you never sin again. And if you still have sin in your life, well, you're not free then because Jesus said the truth shall make you free. Someone else might say, well, no, it's the consequences of sin. It's essentially getting saved. Um, it's just synonymous. The truth shall make you free. You shall be saved. Um, or is it something else? The truth will set you free from something that's not one of those uh, two other things. So we need to look carefully at this, spend a bit of time looking at this. So consider then that in verse 31, Jesus was speaking specifically, in, at least in this sentence, to the Jews which believed on him. And then he goes on to say, uh, if you continue uh, in his word, and he's already established the relationship with uh, his father. So that, that's the target audience for that particular part of the state of the sentence there, the statement. Now, just a few verses ago, in verse 24, he stressed to this crowd that they need to believe on him Otherwise, they shall die in their sins. Uh, we will also see in the upcoming verses that the Jews deny being in any form of bondage, being privileged to be Abraham's seed. But Jesus is going to challenge that notion. So this is all setting the premise of what it means that the truth shall, shall set you free. So at an initial glance, just really briefly looking at what we've just seen then, it would seem most likely that being set free in this context is that by believing in Jesus, you will not die in your sins. So there's not really strong enough evidence from this passage to suggest that a saved person will never sin again um, and is thereby being set free from their propensity to ever sin again. Well, we've already really looked at that previously in this video and in that series. But those who hear Jesus' words and are receptive to those words, they will not see the death that is associated with our sins, dying in them. So that, that would seem to be what the, the initial glance anyway, what, what he means by the truth, setting you free. Uh, this will become more apparent as our study of this chapter progresses, but let's let's look at one potential objection first. So obviously I've just started the argument that uh, being set free does not mean that you're set free from your propensity to ever sin again. Well, someone might object to that then and say, well, if you pay close attention to the tenses, up to now Jesus' frequent encounters in John's Gospel concerning eternal life have suggested that Believing on Christ for eternal life is, is rather instantaneous. So believe on him, have eternal life, is passed from death unto life. Whosoever shall drink of the water that I shall give shall never thirst. Whosoever eats my bread shall never hunger. It appears to be quite instantaneous then and there. But in 832, being set free by the truth is in the future tense while Jesus said this to the Jews that believed on him. So then one might argue that new believers are not set free yet of whatever it is that we need to be set free from. So he turns to those that have believed on him and he says, you shall, future tense, know the truth and the truth shall make you free. But maybe it's not made you free quite just yet. And again, this is going to be the typical prevalent view among those with a works-based salvation or conditional security where we can lose our salvation or sinless perfectionism because they're going to assert, based on this verse, that salvation is more of a journey and a process where we need to overcome all of our simple, sinful habits, hence shall make you free. Um, this is especially in light of verse 34. So what I would say then is, is hold on to that thought, because we can revisit this when we have a more holistic picture of Jesus' conversation here. So let, let's continue our study through the verses and we, we can revisit this, this issue. Now, what you'll notice at a glance here is that he says in verse 32 that we've just read, you shall know the truth and truth shall make you free. And then in verse 36, it says, if the son shall therefore make you free, you shall be free indeed. And so because verses 32 and 36 are very similar, they act as bookends for the verses that are in between to help further define them. So you've kind of got the beginning and then you've got this chunk in the middle of these three verses. And then you've got the end, which is pretty much the same as the beginning. So for the benefit of anyone who's hard of sight, let's just reread from 31 and we'll go up to 36. So then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, we be Abraham's seed and were never in bondage to any man. How do you say you shall be made free? Jesus answered them, verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever commits sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abides not in the house forever, but the son abides forever. If the son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. So in verse 33, we have a really good 
uh, context verse here for how they shall be made free. We are Abraham's seed. We are not in bondage to any man. How do you say we will be free? So the Jews being spoken to here deny being in any form of bondage on account of their Jewish ancestry. Jesus' statements are in opposition to this, and we will see in the upcoming verses. He already told the Pharisees earlier that they would die in their sins. Jesus will continue this thought in verses 37 and 38. I know that you are Abraham's seed, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak that which I have seen with my father, and you do that which you have seen of your, with your father. So, Back here in verse 33, the Jews being spoken to here deny being in any form of bondage, despite o overhearing Jesus say to the Pharisees that they would die in their sins. But the Son, or the truth, can make them free. And this is consistent with previous conversations Jesus has had with Jews and Pharisees, such as in John chapter 6 and in John chapter 7, whereby most of them persistently rejected him. Um, consider that uh, contextually as well, this is uh, consistent with Paul's writings, particularly in Romans 9 to 11. Uh, they assumed themselves to be God's people and Abraham's seed on account of their fleshly physical descendancy from Abraham, as according to their genealogical records. But of course, given everything that we know from the Bible in its totality, we know from Paul's writings and from other statements in the Bible that the true sons of Abraham, the children of God, are by faith, not by flesh or ancestry. So, for example, in John 1, 12 to 13, this is uh, John the disciple is narrating in his gospel, but as many as received him to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So there you go. The sons of God are born by faith, not by flesh or, or the will of man or of blood. Matthew uh, chapter 3, verse 9, and this is John the Baptist talking, not to be confused with John the disciple. And think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children onto Abraham. So in other words, again, you can't just say Abraham is our father, we're clear. You have to believe on this coming Christ. And then Romans 9, 30 to 32. I could obviously pick other passages in Romans, but this just seemed like a good, uh, a good few verses collected together. What shall we say then? That the Gentiles, which followed not after righteousness, have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith, but Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, has not attained to the law of righteousness. Why? Because they sought it not by faith, but as if it were by the works of the law, for they stumbled at the stumbling stone. And obviously that, that's not really telling you a lot there, because you'd really have to get to the whole thing for more information on that. But they're not Abraham's seed just because they follow the law of Abraham or they descend from Abraham. It has to come by uh, faith. Now, again, just to remind you of the conversational context here, because in verse 31, it said, then said Jesus to the Jews, which believed on him. But then the conversation very quickly turns sour in the next few verses. And in 37, he's saying, I know uh, that you are Abraham's seed, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. Well, that would seem to not jive very well with what just happened in verse 31. So let's set a bit of context to the crowd that he's talking to. So as per verse 12, when it said, then spake Jesus unto them, saying, and in 13, the Pharisees therefore said, Jesus was originally talking to the Pharisees. Then in verse 20 and uh, 22, Jesus spake in the, in the treasury, then said the Jews. So Jesus was speaking in a public place and Jews responded rather than specifically the Pharisees. So that there must have been other people listening into this conversation. This must have been quite a public audience, actually. So then in verse 31, said Jesus to those Jews which believed, and then they answered him in verse 33. Um, and in, later on in verse 48, it's going to say, then answered the Jews. So although Jesus specifically and intentionally addressed the Jews that believed on him in verses 31 and 32 specifically, this was a public crowd of Jews that were being addressed. And so the Jews who didn't believe would have assumed that he was talking to them as well. So addressing the unsaved Jews will consist of the majority of the upcoming chapter. So I just pointed that out just in case you're a bit confused as to whether he's talking to saved Jews or unsaved Jews or, or both. <laughs> 
Now, between verses 34 to 36, so again, whosoever commits sin is the servant of sin, and the servant abides not in the house forever, but the son abides forever. If the son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. We need to carefully look at exactly what Jesus means here, because once again, those who preach conditional security or works salvation or sinless perfectionism, they love to use verses like this. Because here in verse 34, Jesus uses a very one-dimensional statement that anybody who commits sin is the servant of sin. It's quite quite plain and, and simple. They, they love that verse. So let's spend some time on this to carefully consider what Jesus means by saying that. So then, whosoever commits sin is the servant of sin. What exactly does this mean? Well, this verse is interpreted in a variety of different ways, depending on who you ask, because it's it's very one-dimensional, um, and define, defining commits in this context is problematic. So, interpretation one, you could say, who whoever has sinned, or has ever sinned, is the servant of sin, i.e. is a sinner, or has sinned, and is under the condemnation if they're not saved. Interpretation two says, well, it's whosoever sins, any sin at all is the servant of it. So whoever is righteous must live in sinlessness. It is not possible for a person to remain saved if still doing any sin. Interpretation three would say it, it does not mean perfection, but it, it means whoever me makes a practice of sinning and so just has a generally sinful lifestyle with no particular intention of repenting. That That kind of a person is a servant of sin. And so obviously we have three different interpretations there as to what exactly that means. Now, the word commit or commitment in this verse is, is a synonym for do or does, or at least has an intention to do. Though uh, commitment is a very complex word in English because it can have various meanings and contexts, which, which are what makes this verse quite difficult to understand at first. So commitment may refer to a one-off final action or pledge. For example, I commit however much money to whatever fund. Um, a commit may also refer to a series of to-dos, which, which may be continual or not continual. So, for example, I could say, I'm busy with several commitments tomorrow. Well, such commitments may include ongoing actions, such as going to work, or one-off actions, such as just sorting a problem with my bank account. A commitment may also refer to a dedication of ongoing actions. For example, you need to show more commitment towards practicing the piano. So, it could mean a one-off action, it could mean ongoing actions, it, it's a very problematic word because it, it can really mean either of those. And it can mean just one action or it can mean a, a list of actions. So, generally speaking, it's, it's used to refer to an intention, uh, a pledge or an oath or an agreement or a plan to, to do something, irrespective of whether that action is continual or one-off and whether or not it actually is or isn't carried out. So it's quite a broad word, really, which makes this verse difficult to understand. Now, comparing the King... Because I'm reading the King James Bible, even though I modernise it when I'm saying it, it's, I'm still using the King James. Comparing it with other English translations in their ever-failing conquest to make life easier for us doesn't really help address this lack of clarity, because actually, I would argue, other Bibles may use even more problematic wording. So in the King James, the word is commit. Uh, the word commit is obviously ambiguous. It can be a one-off action or a continual action. Uh, in the ESV, it actually says, I say unto you that everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. And so this word practices implies an ongoing action. And, and this is actually a very problematic translation because where do you actually draw the line between someone who's practicing sin and has a sinful lifestyle versus somebody who doesn't live a sinful lifestyle but just makes mistakes. When does it become a practice and when is it just a one-off? So I don't really find that a very helpful alternative, to be honest. The NIV says everyone who sins, so it doesn't even have a word like commits or practices. It just turn, turns the word sin into the action itself. So removing the word altogether leaves us with the same dilemma. When it says everyone who sins, well, is that everyone who sins continually or has an ongoing problem or just anyone who ever sins once? It, it, it's still a problematic translation there. And then uh, the GWT, I think there's a good word translation, I can't remember, but it says, I can guarantee this truth, whoever lives a sinful life. And so this is more of a paraphrase or a dynamic equivalent. And, and really it just flat out promotes work salvation. But this term... It's similar to the term practices. We have this arbitrary line uh, between whether it's ongoing sin 
uh, and when that becomes a sinful lifestyle or when it just becomes someone who's still saved but makes mistakes. I don't know where to draw this line with these translations. So I'm just going to stick with the King James. Well, now I've got to define what it means to commit a sin. So let's look at another example of, of this word committing a sin, as it will help give us some clarity about what Jesus means. So Jesus said in Matthew 5, 27 to 28, You have heard that it was said of them of old time, you shall not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looks on a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. So then, how many times does a person have to do an adulterous act to have violated the law you shall not commit adultery. Well, the answer's simple. It, it's it's only once. And, and we actually already saw this earlier in our study of John chapter 8. The woman caught in adultery only had to be found out once, and she was already considered guilty before them. So it, it's not evident from the passage at all that she had some perpetually adulterous lifestyle. She only had to be caught once. She only had to do it once and be caught doing it to then be accused of committing adultery. And notice as well that in, in Matthew 5 here, Jesus actually enhanced the Old Testament commandment because he's saying here that whosoever looks on a woman to lust after, so he, do, he doesn't even have to do anything technically, he just has to look upon her to lust after. It doesn't even say that by doing this, he is committing adultery. He has already committed adultery with her already. So it's already been done. So just the lustful intent and has already committed adultery. Now, I'm sure if a lot of men are honest, they say that this is something that they really, really struggle with. And so when we see then whosoever commits sin, well, you only have to look upon a woman to lust after and you have already committed sin. So this will then help us when we return to John chapter 8 to understand exactly what's going on. But in conclusion, what, what we can see there is that even doing a sin once or even having a desire or an intention to sin, even without doing the action, is in of itself committing sin. There's no ongoing practice or lifestyle for it to be committing sin. It's just the one intention alone. And, and that's it. OK, now, somebody then might object to the way that I'm handling John 8.34. So someone might object and say, well, John 8.34 is in the present tense. It's not the past tense. So wouldn't this imply then that being Jesus' disciple cannot include ongoing sins uh, being committed? That they must sin no more so as to not be the servant of sin. Well, there are other verses in the Bible that, that deal with sin as a continual or a present tense while being applied to the gospel or the consequences of God's own people sinning. So we're just going to take a look at a few. And again, it's just going to help us get an overall picture of what Jesus is actually uh, intending to point out to us in John chapter 8. So Ecclesiastes 7.20, for there is not a just man upon the earth that does good and sins not. So that's all present tense. Uh, it's quite hyperbolic there. It says there is not a just man upon the, the whole earth. So that would indicate that it actually covers both believers and uh, non-believers in that sense. Uh, Psalm 14 and also 53 is a very similar reading between verses 1 to 3. The fool has said in his heart there is no God, they are corrupt, they have done abominable works. There is none that does good. The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. They are all gone aside, they are altogether become filthy. There is none that does good, no, not one. So again, present tense, uh, quite dramatic, quite hyperbolic. And although in their proper context, those psalms would appear as if they're talking specifically about the unsaved or people that just don't believe in God, uh, you know, the children of men, but not the children of God. But in the New Testament, though, when Paul partially quotes this and paraphrases it in Romans chapter 3, he applies it to both Jews and Gentiles, that all are under sin, and that that's why righteousness must come by faith and not the deeds of, of the law. Another good passage is 1 Kings 8, where Solomon is praying for the Israelites. And I've grayed some text out because it's not necessarily relevant to the point that I'm getting across. And for the sake of time, I'm not, I'm not going to read this entire section here, just because it, it, for the sake of time. But between verses 46 and 51 in this prayer, we see that Solomon is praying for God's people. And it's if they, your people, sin against you, for there is not, uh, no man that sins not, present tense. And this is in the context of God's own people and then it goes on to explain 
if they sin against you and you do this and send them into a land far away but then if they shall repent of that sin and come back to you and admit that they've done that then you will bring them out of of that land and you will hear their prayer and you will forgive uh, these people and again in the context of god's own people sinning against him and then in verse 51 it clarifies by saying for they are your people they are your inheritance so even people that are god's inheritance still have this propensity to sin against him and in my video on my channel about repentance i went into a lot more detail about these verses that deal with the issue of a believer that sins and so you can't just take the john passage about committing sin and then just pretend that all of these other verses don't exist okay we have to bring everything and, and consider the bible in, in its entirety and uh, you know in verse 46 this is the present tense it starts with an if well, maybe it's just if they sin against you, they might not sin against you. But then it goes on to say in brackets, for there is no man that sins not. So, you know, that encompasses absolutely everybody there. So because of passages like that and plenty of others that we could turn to, it, it doesn't really make sense to interpret John 8, 34 through the lens of sinless perfectionism or uh, conditional security to say that a believer can never sin. Otherwise, he is the servant of sin and cannot be a servant of God. Uh, and, you know, they'll say that that forfeits his salvation because a servant cannot serve two masters and, and so on and so forth, which is something that we quote out of context. But there you go. So interpreting these uh, this verse in, in this kind of a way really is just to completely ignore multiple and abundant passages in the Bible for the sake of one verse that's actually rather enigmatic, really. Um, in multiple prayers in the Old Testament, prayers were made to intercede for the sins of god's own people jesus taught his disciples how to pray you know give us lord our daily bread this is how to pray daily and forgive us our sins and he taught to forgive one another's sins for our own forgiveness and so uh, and also psalm 130 uh, psalm 130 verse 4 sorry says that there is forgiveness with god specifically so that he may be feared that's that's what it says there uh, james 2 10 says if you transgress one law you transgress them all which is perfectly consistent with this verse and the point that it's making here so returning to the passage then we can see that even just committing one sin puts somebody in the category of a servant of sin so uh, what does jesus mean by a servant of sin and, and what's the purpose of him saying this here well the clue lies in the next uh, verses the analogy that he uses that a servant abides not in the house forever but the son abides forever so the key key lies in in this verse a, a servant may be paid or unpaid depending on context but he he's typically not a permanent member of the family or, or a member at all really uh, he may have a limited amount of time of servitude there may, there may be a time when his servitude stops um, and he does not have any inheritance he doesn't inherit the family uh, fortune or the family house it, it, so that's what he could take to mean by abiding in, in the house whereas the son is an heir uh, he is always a member of the family. He inherits the family assets and his children will inherit it um, from him as well. Now, some, uh, or well, actually most modern translations translate servant as slave instead. Um, a slave of sin sounds a bit more dramatic, I suppose, a bit more hyperbolic. Uh, doing a quick search on the Greek word, the slave is considered a more appropriate translation, apparently, but there are sources that reveal that a servant is a suitable and a possible translation. So... For me personally, I think depending on how you interpret a, a servant or a slave to sin shall not abide in the house forever, the word servant seems to make more contextual sense. So, uh, for example, the, the Old Testament law put a death penalty on enforced, unwarranted slavery. Uh, the acceptable conditions of enforced servitude would have been things like de debt bonds or agreed financial arrangements with the family of the servant or the servant's own choice, actually, in some cases. Um, he could you know, choose to be a, a servant for the remainder of his life uh, of his own volition, if he so wished. Uh, for Hebrew servants, this would typically be for a limited time, or at least it should have been for a limited time, in theory, according to the law. While for foreigners, it, it would be everlasting onto their future generations until any debt bonds were resolved, as long as that would, would take. So, typically in the ancient world, slaves were treated as property or lower class citizens, and their children would be the property of the master. So, in a way, the slaves continued to abide in the house in, in a manner of, of speaking. And moreover, the most crucial thing is that servants earn wages. Slaves typically do not. So those who commit sin are the servants of sin because there is a wage to be paid for that sin. That's why they're the servant of it. 
whereas those who believe on Christ are adopted as the sons of God. And I'm not going to read all this out because Romans 6 will eventually, God willing, get its own uh, video in this series. But Romans 6 uh, talks about this, about yielding your members to righteousness because unto whom you yield those are the servants you are the servant to obey it so you were the servants of sin but you've been made free from sin and so there's a key point there you have become the servants of, of righteousness and when you read romans in its full context you see that well you were a servant of sin you've been made free from that but there is still the spirit warring against the flesh those two are contrary towards the other and you have to bring the flesh into subjection and a key point is in romans 6 23 it says the wages of sin is death but the gift of god is eternal life uh, through jesus christ our lord so then let's apply the analogy that jesus is using to sin and, and him being the son of god so we see that there's two contrasting options here essentially if you do not believe that jesus is he the son of god you shall die in your sins that's what he said in verse 24 so you can claim to never be in bondage to sin as these people were trying to do for whatever reason they they claimed ancestry to abraham in this case but even if you commit which is to do or intend or desire to do even one single sin you are essentially the servant of sin and you shall die in your sins that's why as paul said there is no righteousness from the law you will not abide in the house forever which you could take to mean the limited avail time available to repent unto eternal life because once you die in your sins this this opportunity closes um so supporting verses for that for example john twelve thirty five says and jesus jesus said unto them yet a little while is the light with you walk while you have the light lest darkness come upon you hebrews nine twenty seven, and it is appointed unto men once to die but after this the judgment so then you can start to see how jesus is laying foundations here and then paul is going to build on those foundations in his epistle so even just committing one sin or having a desire or an intention to do that sin bring somebody under bondage they become the servant of sin and there is not a just man upon the earth that does good and sins not so everybody becomes a servant of sin they cannot attain righteousness through the law and uh, a servant is owed wages well the wages of sin is is death as, as paul told us and so that's essentially what jesus has to set us free from and so other than being the servant of sin then the other option is to believe on jesus believe on the lord jesus christ and those people who do that shall not die in their sins ergo the truth shall make them free the son abides in his house forever why because jesus offers eternal life to those that believe as we have consistently seen throughout john's gospel up until this point so this is what we are set free from it's dying in our sins already the servant of sin so we're going to die in those sins because that's the wages for the servants of sin the wages of sin so then the gift of god is through his son eternal life to those that believe and that's why the son abides in the house forever uh, so this is what we're set free from it's dying in our sins and by extension of this the condemnation of eternal judgment in hell now bear in mind that jesus is talking to a mixed audience here there were some jews that believed on him there were some that didn't so of the jews that did believe on him they are one to continue in his word so as to be jesus's disciples the con in the context of eternal life not not fellowship or discipleship though unless they be as like the disciples at the end of john chapter 6 where we saw they stumbled at jesus's words and walked no more with him so they didn't continue in his word of which jesus already knew from the beginning that they did not believe uh, they did not lose salvation because they, they were never saved as we saw when, quite clearly when we looked at john chapter 6 so given what we have here uh we, we don't really have enough context to assume that this means believers are set free from the propensity to sin itself and that this goes completely against what we read elsewhere in the bible um, and it's not the topic of discussion here really jesus is addressing a mixed audience including a lot of unsaved jews and pharisees in romans 6 uh, where we cross-reference turning from sin and yielding the body to righteousness is more of a subject matter but that passage is addressed to those who already believe and paul did address their infirmity of the flesh as well even though these are already believers in, in his audience so the propensity to sin itself is still there but uh, romans god willing we'll just have to wait until its own study video later in the series so wrapping up this particular point then with, with all of this in mind we can see now why jesus said the truth shall make you free in a future tense uh, remember so remember earlier i told you to hold on to that thought so let's, let's just summarize what's going on here there's a mixed audience 
and there were some Jews who believed on him, but there were many Jews and Pharisees in this audience who didn't believe on him, and they didn't acknowledge being in bondage to sin. So Jesus needs to reaffirm this to the non-believing. Jesus has already dealt with disciples in John 6 that did not continue with him because they stumbled at his words. The truth did not set them free. They remained the servants of sin, but Jesus already knew that from the beginning. Obviously, it does happen that there are false converts who believe for a while, uh, as the parable goes, but then stumble and fall away, as it's described in the parable of, of the seeds that fell in various places. We have seen previously in John that whosoever believes, and that's with a genuine belief, not, not the belief of the falling away seed, but a genuine belief is passed from death unto life. But still being in our mortal bodies, this eternal life has not yet fully manifested itself and so when we looked briefly at Romans 6 it said in verse 22 he said to you that, that you believers are now being made free from sin but the end is eternal life so it's the end it's not yet manifested itself fully so the body itself is still dead because of sin and, and Paul will go into that in a lot more detail uh, in the epistles that John is obviously just laying down the, the foundations here so I hope that helps deal with the servant of sin issue. So uh, next we can move on to uh, Abraham's seed, and this is going to be very significant for the remainder of the chapter. So Jesus carries on this conversation where he left off after telling them that the truth shall set them free. So between verses 37 to 40, I'll read up to 40. I know that you are Abraham's seed, but you seek to kill me, because my word has no place in you. I speak that which I have seen with my father, and you do that which you have seen with your father. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said unto them, If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God, this did not Abraham. Now I've included some more verses in grey just for context, but we'll, we'll look at those later, the, the greyed out for now. So here we can see that Jesus acknowledges that they are Abraham's seed, but goes on to say that their works prove that they're not Abraham's children. So yes, they are the physical offspring of Abraham, but in, in terms of their seed, but they're not his children. Now, now some people would say that that's a bit of a strange distinction, but that, that would fit the context of what Jesus is talking about here. Because if they were his children, they would have an inheritance with Abraham. So the, the promises and, and eternal life, but, but they have no part of that inheritance. So they, they are his seed, but they're not his children, if, if that makes sense. So we did already touch on this earlier uh, when we looked at their denial of, of being in bondage uh, and we, we looked at cross references for that. Uh, John's gospel does not go too deeply into the doctrine about Abraham's children being of faith rather than of blood. So uh, Romans 9 to 11 obviously delves into that in a lot more detail. So we can't really cover it in this study in too much detail. And something to point out here in verses uh, 37 and 38 particularly is Jesus is spelling it out for us here that any any Jews who reject him and in this in this particular scenario sought to kill him they are not of God the Father they they have their own father which later verses in this chapter will clarify is the devil essentially um, the reason why this is important is uh, for Christians to understand it is their relationship with Judaism. Some Christians have a very obs unhealthy obsession with the nation of Israel, the Hebrew language and, and Jewish practices. And, you know, I mean, things like the church has put in the Israeli flag up for, for some bizarre reason. You have these Hebrew roots movements. You have these black Israelite movements. You have these messianic Jews and, and calling Jesus Yeshua and all that kind of stuff. This is very, I assert this is very dangerous though, because it, it leads Christians into thinking that Christ rejecting Jews get a free pass as God's people just because they're Jewish when in actual fact they need the gospel just as much as any Muslim or, or Hindu and that's very clear from this chapter they can't just claim that we're the seed of Abraham and we get a free pass they need to believe on the Christ if they reject the Christ unfortunately they reject eternal life with that and they reject inheritance and moreover these sort of Judaizing movements or, or like where it seems like the Jews are messianic Jews like Jews for Jesus and these groups you always have to watch out for those because even if they claim to acknowledge Jesus or believe in Jesus or love Jesus while still being Jewish you have to question what is your salvation is there works of the law in there somewhere and, and that's what I often find with these kind of Hebrew roots and Judaizing movements is that well 
they still claim to believe in a messiah but but they still believe in obedience of of works to the law completely contrary to everything that that paul tells us so so watch out for groups like that to be to be quite frank so that's all i'm really going to say on that particular issue um but uh no you know if jews reject jesus the messiah or if they still trust in the law for salvation according to this chapter they are the the servants of sin they they do not have eternal life un, un, under that now something that really needs to be addressed at and looked carefully here is that in verses 39 to 40 so where, where jesus says if you were the children of abraham you would do the works of abraham but you seek to kill me and abraham did not do this so people who believe in a works-based salvation or that you can lose salvation they're going to use these verses to claim that you have to have works for salvation now sometimes they'll try and distinguish between works of the law versus works of faith but essentially what they're doing is they're saying that you have to have the works of abraham to be abraham's children so you have to have these fruits of righteousness otherwise you don't have eternal life well this is really this is a very moronic handling of this verse because first of all they're conflating the cause and the effect okay there's a cause and the effect and they just flip those around and really in the context of what we're looking at here this passage has absolutely nothing to do with works of righteousness versus works of the flesh for believers it, it's a it's about a very specific evil work of this particular group of jews in opposition to how abraham and his children would would ever behave okay that that's quite important that we understand that so let, let's just visualize this so what comes in very clearly in verse 39 is that it says if you were abraham's children so being abraham's children is the condition or the cause doing the works of abraham is the effect so if these jews that jesus is talking to are really abraham's children well if the answer is yes they would do the works of abraham otherwise so the opposite of that if they were not abraham's children they seek to kill jesus so this is these are the opposites this is something that's quite specific in its proper context so the folly of turning this passage into a thing about works for salvation or that you can lose salvation if you don't have those works is that they've now flipped the cause and effect and around so they're saying do you do the works of abraham well if the answer is yes you are abraham's child and if the answer is no you are not abraham's child but but what relevance is this to the people in this chapter who seek to kill jesus what where are they addressed in this paradigm that this is completely ignored even though it's a, a key point relating to the dialogue and, and just in case you're wondering so let's ask this hypothetical question what about people who didn't do the works of abraham quote unquote by which the work salvation crowd they mean you know do all these works fit for a believer so people didn't do these works but they also didn't seek to kill jesus either and, and a couple of examples of this now you might not think this is a great example this first one but Pilate found jesus innocent now yes he did action jesus's crucifixion but he did appeal to the jews against it he did not seek it wantingly he didn't want this to happen he was under political pressure by the jews and the pharisees and he instead sort of tried to play what we might call the agnostic card like what is truth who really knows and he tried to wash his hands of that situation so he didn't really seek to kill jesus but he wasn't exactly somebody who was full of the works of abraham right uh, nicodemus would be another interesting example because he seemed more favorable towards jesus than most of the pharisees he tried to calm the other pharisees down in john chapter 7 when they were trying to catch him we saw that in the last video and later in john 19 if we assume that that is the same nicodemus he helped embalm jesus's body but we don't know for sure that he ever actually got saved or that he even repented of his membership among the pharisees so which category do these people fit in do they do the works of abraham or do they seek to kill jesus because really i'm having a hard time fitting those characters in into either one well the answer is neither because once again th this passage has nothing to do with believers bringing forth fruits or works of the spirit or obedience versus non-believers or false believers or idol believers not having these works or bringing forth evil fruit or evil works of the flesh or disobedience this is not the context of this passage plain and simple it has nothing to do with this chapter the group that jesus is speaking to have heard the truth yet they not only reject the truth which is bad enough in of itself 
but they want to kill Jesus while at the same time claiming to be the children of Abraham. This is the issue with this chapter. This is what's going on. And so this is what Jesus is trying to address here with what he's saying. Now, Abraham and his true children, the people that acknowledge the truth, they would not dream of killing the Christ. And in fact, verse 56 later in this chapter shows that Abraham rejoiced to see Christ's day, quite in opposition to what this group are claiming, despite the fact that they claim to be his children. So that this is what's going on here in this chapter. So then the purpose of doing the works of Abraham here is to highlight that these Jews and Pharisees are not Abraham's children because they do the opposite of what Abraham and his true children would ever do. Now, if these Jews were Abraham's children, then they would do this, do the works of Abraham. Instead, because they're not Abraham's children, they do this, they seek to kill Jesus. This this kind of hypothetical person that has faith but doesn't have any good works to show for it. This is utterly irrelevant to the matter being discussed. And so this is why it's just so ridiculous to use this verse to say, well, you have to have works to be saved or you can lose your salvation if you don't pursue these works because if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works. They're just taking that verse completely out of the context of what Jesus is using it for. It has nothing to do with the works of a believer or, you know, the worse is the lack of works of an idol believer. That's not relevant to the matter being discussed. The matter being discussed is these people who want to kill Jesus quite in opposition to Abraham's true children. That's what this chapter is about. So continuing this conversation then between verses 41 to 47. You do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, We be born not of fornication, we have one father, even God. Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he that sent me. Why do you not understand my speech, even because you cannot hear my word? You are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Which of you convinces me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? He that is of God hears God's words. You therefore hear them not, because you are not of God. And so here we see essentially a repeat of the same points, except that the stakes are higher. So not only do they claim to be Abraham's children, they even claim to be God's children, which Jesus completely refutes with pretty much the same points he raised before about Abraham's children. They are not God's children because they seek to kill the Son of God and they do not hear his words of truth. And Jesus uses very strong language here, uh, even to go as far as to say that the devil is their father. Now, one minor comment about verse 41, it says, we be born not of for uh, fornication. It's not entirely clear whether they were indirectly accusing Jesus of being uh born of fornication as opposed to being born of a virgin uh, which would make sense given their rejection of him but we, d we don't really know a lot around what exactly they meant by that and Jesus doesn't address that point uh, specifically it's possible that they were hinting at it or they were just specifically addressing their own claim of, of being uh, of the father god uh, so I, I can't really delve too much into that it's just a possibility of what's going on there now I get the impression that there seems to be a lot more going on beneath the surface in this conversation than than just the the words of the conversation itself the Jews being spoken to here they are devil's children and as such they are completely and utterly resistant to the truth seemingly incapable of accepting Christ and are completely blinded to his words now because Jesus is speaking to a group of people here we we don't know from the narration how many uh, if any uh, members of this crowd had encountered Jesus several times before uh, to somebody who doesn't really know Jesus and has not seen him do any miracles or has not heard his preaching prior to this encounter on the superficial surface of things it may seem as if he's been somewhat bold or arrogant or or prideful here you, you know if if he didn't know that he was the Christ I mean but uh, bearing in mind that many of the Pharisees present would have encountered him several times before he preached several times at the temple so uh, regular visitors would would likely be quite accustomed to seeing him preach uh, at the temple and moreover there are plenty of examples elsewhere in the gospels where the pharisees and the jews 
did not believe on Christ even after seeing him do miracles. For example, the scribes in Mark chapter 3, they saw him cast out devils. They even acknowledged that he was casting out devils, but they accused him of doing it by the power of Satan. Um, and very similarly, later in this chapter, they will accuse Jesus of being demon-possessed in this chapter as well. Uh, there are several verses in the Gospels showing that Jesus knows the hearts of man, and Jesus already has preconceived knowledge about many of the people that he's speaking to. So he knows that the people in John chapter 8 are filled with lies. He perceives that even without any deductive reasoning. He just knows that about them. And so uh, that's why they want to murder someone who speaks the truth, even Christ himself. So it's not just that Christ is being a bit too big for his boots here. They must have some idea of who he is, and they must hate the truth to a point of this is why they they want to do this. And we see a similar parallel to this dialogue, actually. Um, in Matthew 23, 25 to 31, Jesus rebuked the hypocrisy of the scribes and Pharisees because they claimed that they would have not partaken with their ancestral fathers in killing the prophets had they been around at that time. And yet here they are in John chapter 8, seeking to kill the one to whom all the prophets give witness, according to Acts 10, 43. And this is nothing new, it's nothing old either. Um, in theory, uh, the Old Testament Jews and Israelites should have been God's people, at least in theory, yet we persistently see that they fell away and killed the prophets and, and priests. And, and if they didn't, well, then why would the Pharisees even be saying that in Matthew 23? They did kill the prophets and priests. In the early days of the New Testament, the Jews believed that they were the true Jewish line, the children of Abraham, the seed of Abraham, but they killed Christ that they had been looking for for so long and persecuted Christians in the, later in the New Testament who, who did believe in the Jewish Messiah. So again, they claim to be of the true line, yet they do the works of somebody who's evil and is of the devil. And later in history, as uh, Jewish persecution started to decline, Catholicism emerged and hoard with the Roman state. They claimed, once again, it's the same spirit that drives all this. They claimed to be the true church that Jesus founded. And yet for hundreds of years, they persecuted and killed the true believers of God, denouncing them as heretics and prevented the Bible from being translated or made publicly available. Now, in some cases, those persecuted groups were heretical, but the reasoning behind the persecution wasn't usually the gospel, to be honest. and the reasonings could include saved Christians as well, such as, for example, if a group rejected the doctrine of transubstantiation. And fast forwarding the clock some more, Islam emerged, and again, they claimed to be the true Abrahamic succeeding faith, and really just continued what the Roman Catholics left behind. In, in some parts of the world today, strong conservative Islamic countries are still very dangerous for Christians in many cases. Um, and even in the early days of the Reformation, Protestants saw themselves as the true successors to early Christianity by breaking away from the heretical and apostate practices of the Roman Catholic Church. Yet there were incidents, although much less extreme on the grand scheme of uh, things, among their exalted reformers such as Luther and Calvin, where again, just like the Roman Catholic Church before them, they yoked with political forces and actioned persecution against minority groups of Christians, such as, for example, the Anabaptist. And, and as with Roman Catholic persecution of these kind of groups, yes, some of them may have been heretical, but the grounds, the reasoning for the persecution could have included saved Christians as well. And so you see that this is the habit of the devil's children. They think that they are the righteous seed, yet they do these evil things that only Satan would do because the righteous seed would never do these things. And so you can see how there's, there's nothing new under the sun as it is written. So we, we see this mentality here. There's these Groups of people perceiving themselves to be the, the true group, Abraham's true children, in bondage to no man, and yet because they are full of lies, they persecute the Christ and they persecute his, his true followers. And these issues, that they're not merely denominations that are just off on a few issues, but otherwise okay. Christ is clear here. They reject Christ and they will die in their sins. It's, it's perfectly clear from this chapter. Now, Persecution is a bit off topic from salvation doctrine, though. Um, extreme persecution amongst doctrinally divided groups is, is perhaps no longer common now as, as the church and state are separated politically. But you can see that this mentality and this underlying spirit of rejecting the words of Christ and hating the truth, while claiming to be Abraham's seed uh, and under the, no bondage, is it, still very much there. It, it really is uh, there uh, in, in a lot of what's called Christianity today. So then, these devil's children that resist the truth, how does this manifest? Well, I'll give you a few examples. So you, you try to show something to the devil's children, just like Jesus was trying to show them in John chapter 8. They'll give you a reply, and what's actually 
that what's actually going on is there's double speak behind what they're saying. If you really think carefully about the implications of what they're saying. So you say to the devil's children, Jesus said, my father is greater than all, and I give unto them eternal life, and no man is able to pluck them out of my hand. He said, well, that's what the Bible says. There's the truth. That's the words of Jesus. You show that to the devil's children and you'll get an answer along the lines of, but you can still walk away. He won't lose you so long as you endure to the end. And so what the double speak of that reply is that you can't trust Jesus to fulfill what he said he would do. The father's hand is not really greater than yours. Security in Jesus's eternal commitment to you is, is demonic. That That's essentially the, the logical outcome of what they're saying. But they'll obviously say it a lot nicer than that. You point out to them, Paul said salvation is by grace through faith, not of works. It's a free gift. Jesus only told Nicodemus and the woman at the well and the Jews in John chapter 6 to believe on him and they would never hunger. They would never thirst. You, you point that out to them. And this is kind of the reply that you get from them. It's not enough to just believe. Faith alone is demonic. The Bible is clear we need to be baptised. You need to repent of your sins to be saved. Otherwise, you're giving people a free ticket to heaven. That is cheap grace. That That's the kind of reply that you're going to get from them. And so, well, what's the double speak of the devil's children here? Well, essentially then, they have to say that Jesus preached a false and incomplete gospel multiple times to multiple people. You have to say that Paul preached a false gospel. The free gift of eternal life, you have to say it's not really a free gift of grace. It's actually very expensive and it will cost you everything you have. The Bible says it's a free gift. The Bible says it's grace. But that's the double speak of what they're actually saying. The devil's children cannot comprehend the truth and they always have excuses and answers to override the truth with, with their own point of view. And the thing is, you know, I'm not necessarily talking about maybe a Christian who's been stuck in uh, something wrong or apostate for like 20 years and then they come out of that and get saved. Because, you know, in many cases they may have done that out of ignorance. But there are devil's children who they, they know the Bible very well. They know exactly what it says. They've had all these sorts of arguments and they, they still continue to resist the truth, even when all their points it's just completely indisputable that there's no debate between these things but they still dispute it just like the pharisees and the jews are doing in john chapter 8 and so then what starts to happen is as these people are given over to their false gospel and their delusions again you try and point things out to them and you just get the same uh stupid response for example you point out to people on both occasions when jesus said sin no more he never mentioned believing on him he never mentioned eternal life. He wasn't preaching the gospel when he said that. But you just get the same repeat of completely unironically. Well, Jesus said, go and sin no more. Makes perfect sense to me. Our salvation depends on it. So they just don't grasp this basic concept at all. They, they just cannot divide the word of God in this regard. Here's another example. You try and show the devil's children. When James said, justified by faith and works, the context was the benefit of the brethren. When he said, can faith save him? He proceeded with, though a man say he have faith. He doesn't say that he actually had faith. He just said he had faith. And really, James there is asking an open question. He's not making a statement, technically speaking. Whereas when Paul said, justified by faith without works, the con the context was righteousness before God. When he said, to him that works not, but believes on him that justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. He wasn't asking a question like James was. He was making a clear statement not asking an open question. So again, you point out the context to them. You try and show them the justification in James with works versus the justification of Paul without works and how that actually applies. And once again, they cannot separate the gospel from the life of a believer. And so you just get this same line. Faith without works is dead. Faith without works is dead. Blah, blah. They just keep repeating that because, you know, it, they just keep defaulting back to that infinite loop that they just they just cannot escape from because they cannot put the bible in its proper context they cannot divide between what is for our salvation and what isn't and just like in john chapter 8 the the irony of this is that they, the devil's children they are utterly convinced in their own minds that they are the true children of abraham you try to reply to their false premises but it, it falls on deaf ears because you cannot give sight to the spiritually blinded. And there were even some people that Jesus himself dealt with people, like we see in John chapter 8, where they were a lost cause and, and a servant is not greater than his master. So unfortunately, we are going to encounter people who, it doesn't matter if you answer every objection they have about, you know, about 
with their work salvation or conditional security or sinless perfectionism and you just show why it's wrong, they'll just find another passage and go, what about this? They'll just find another passage and what about this? Well, no, we're the children of Abraham. And it, it just around and around it goes, like, well, you just cannot preach that. You know, it, it, it just, they just cannot see it. They are just spiritually blind. There's something wrong with them. Something is blocking them from just seeing God's simple truth. So they'll say things like, you need to repent of your sins to be saved. If you preach faith without repentance, you're a false prophet. And it's like, well, Jesus preached belief without turning from sin to multiple people in John's gospel. Again, just no grasp of it whatsoever. It just it doesn't register with them at all. They say things like a corrupt tree produces corrupt fruit. If you have any corrupt fruit, you won't make it to heaven. Well, it's like, well, your fruit is work salvation, though. Your works are as filthy rags in his sight. But again, just there's a block. Something is not getting in. They are not perceiving this. And what Jesus is saying is not even that difficult in some cases, but it's just it just will not register them because they are the devil's children. They are given over to this. They cannot get out of this. They are the children of lies, essentially. And so, you know, we can dispense with all of this, the silly memes now. I'm sure you get the uh, you get the idea. But but what you can see here is that this this same spirit that drove these Jews in, in Pharisees back in John chapter eight is very much alive today in Christianity itself. Christianity is no different. There are loads and loads of Christians who who just completely reject the the truth. And so going back to the passage then, uh, bearing in mind that in verse 46, the Pharisees even attempted to trap Jesus. And, and they've done this multiple times throughout the gospel. They tried to catch him on his own words. He answered their objection every single time. He even challenges them here to convince him of sin. But either they did not or they could not respond to this challenge. They just got more riled up against him, and we're going to see that in the upcoming verses. So they reply to them then in verse 48. Bearing in mind, he just said two verses ago, which of you convinces me of sin? They don't even point us into him. They just they an then answered the Jews and said unto him, say we not that you are a Samaritan and has a devil? That That's their reply. They, they don't even point us into him. They just, well, you're obviously a, a devil. You obviously have a devil then, just based on what you, even though they can't actually point to what's wrong with what he said. Jesus answered uh, in verse 49, I have not a devil, but I honour my father, and you do uh, dishonour me. Verse 50, and I seek not mine own glory. There is one that seeks and judges. Verse 51, verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. And so there will be a few more verses yet, but uh, we're obviously starting to see as this chapter's coming towards its end, a very expected conclusion. Jesus just reaffirms he is of the Father. This group are just incapable of hearing it. In verse 48, they accuse him of having a devil. So th this is not too dissimilar to the scribes in Mark 3, who even acknowledge that Jesus is able to cast devils, yet they still accused him of uh, doing it by the power of the devil instead of the Holy Spirit. And in, in doing so, in that context, they committed the unforgivable sin of blaspheming the Holy Spirit. So with this in mind, it would make sense then why this group in John chapter 8 appears to be unsalvageable at this point. Now, something just to address carefully here in verse 51. What what does it mean exactly, if a man keep my saying? Um, well, actually, even those who persecute Christ keep his saying in a manner of speaking, according to John 15.20. So in John 15.20, Jesus is speaking to his disciples and he says, Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also, uh, also persecute you. If they have kept my saying they will keep yours also. And so in John chapter 15, it's those who persecute Christ who kept his saying. But that's quite the opposite of what Christ is saying here in 851, because it's those who keep his saying are not seem to be not the ones who want to put him to death. And so it may seem contradictory. So uh, the most logical interpretation to this, I would say, is when he says, keep my saying, it means hold him to his own words. And so this may vary in context. So let me just sh show you what I mean by that. So in the context of John chapter 8, the one who keeps, the, the ones who keep his saying or hold him to his words are those that believe him when he said, the son shall make you free. I proceeded forth from God the Father who sent me. I tell you the truth. This is all the stuff that he's been saying in this chapter. So the ones that keep his saying, hold him to those words, are those that believe on him when he said those words. So like John 5.24, he that hears my word and believes on him that sent me has everlasting life. So it's hearing those words and holding him to those words, believing him when he said those words. Whereas in the context of John 15, when Christ was warning about his disciples about persecution, those that kept Christ saying in that context and persecuted him, they, they still persecuted him because of his words. It's just that instead of believing his words and keeping him to his words in that way, they kept him to his words and hated him because of those words. 
word. So they will likewise persecute the disciples for preaching those same words because they will hold the disciples to those words, essentially, is what he's saying there. So I hope that helps you. It just helps you to see that keeping Christ's words goes in one of two directions in this exchange. The ones that believe on him, holding to his words that they shall never see death, and the ones that persecute him, holding to his words that they hate and are unable to receive, essentially. Uh, this is perfectly consistent with this chapter because there are those who are the children of Abraham doing the works of Abraham and there are those who are the children of the devil and seek to kill Jesus it's just keeping his words goes in one of two directions now again as I mentioned earlier in this study the prospect of a person that doesn't seek to kill Jesus but doesn't believe on him either is simply not addressed here he is not one that keeps Christ saying either in the John 8 context or the John 15 context and again, the prospect of a believer that doesn't do the works of Abraham is again not addressed here. It's outside the context of this dialogue because Jesus is not talking to saved believers. He's talking to Jews that need to be saved but won't hear it. And so wrapping up this study video, we're getting towards the final verses of this chapter. So the Jews said unto him in verse 52, Now we know that you have a devil, Abraham is dead, and the prophets, and you say, if a man keep my saying, he shall never taste of death. Are you greater than our father Abraham, which is dead? and the prophets are dead, who do you make yourself? Jesus answered, If I honour myself, my honour is nothing, it is my Father that honours me, of whom you say that he is your God. Yet you have not known him, but I know him, and if I should say, I know him not, I shall be a liar like unto you, but I know him and keep his saying. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, You are not yet fifty years old, and have you uh, seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, Truly, truly, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Then they took up stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. So here in the finale, the Jews that rejected him, they, they don't grasp eternal life, they don't grasp the eternal nature of Christ, they don't even point to scripture and show him where he's wrong from scripture, they just don't like what he says, they don't like who he is, they are carnal and they, they just can't understand heavenly things and uh, some of Jesus sayings here are very similar to Luke chapter 20 when Jesus was addressing a question about the resurrection um, Abraham is only dead in a manner of speaking in the flesh because Jehovah the Lord God he's a God of the living he's not the God of the dead but uh, this crowd they, they just assume that they're all dead they, they don't seem to be grasping eternal life uh, properly here so I hope that that has helped you. Uh, this has been quite a complex and profound chapter, somewhat more complicated than some of the earlier chapters in John's Gospel. So uh, God willing, as, as more time progresses, I hope to do more study videos on the remaining chapters of John later in this series. I'm really excited about uh, doing John chapter 10 soon because uh, I absolutely love that chapter. So um, if, if you've found this uh, series interesting, please do keep your eye out for, for more study videos coming out. Thank you for your time.